before you go in that house, you need to leave work at work. When you go in there, your husband, your father. So often, we bring all of the, the failure or the success mm -hmm. of our occupation into our home life, and we end up creating um, a crucible of discouragement and fear and anger in a place that matters the most. Benjamin, it's great to have you back. Man, always good to be here. <laughs> always good to be here with you guys. Why do you think becoming a dad is such a frightening thing to so many young men today? You know, hopefully in the context of marriage, but it doesn't always happen that way today. Yeah, yeah, it, it's frightening because I think innately men understand the responsibility of raising another human being. Do you think they know that even though many will walk away from that responsibility? I think they're convicted about I, it. I, well, let's look in the garden. Let's look at the first man. What He, he walked away. Hmm. Inside of us, we, we have this proclivity, I think, to, to shun responsibility. Totally. And to desert and to be silent uh, and to not step into things that are hard. Many times men flee. And I think we inherited much of that <laughs> in our sin nature from our first father in Adam. Um, and so you see men who um, understand uh, the, the power and the importance of having a child, but perhaps it wasn't demonstrated to them. Or even if they had, had a father, look, I, I, I had a great dad growing up, but they don't give you any directions for raising a kid. Mm -mm. Like you leave the hospital and have nothing. There's no they, manual. They give you they give you better directions for putting together a bicycle <laughs> than they do for raising a kid. And so it can be a very wow. scary thing for a dad, um, especially if if he's not even secure in his own masculinity and who yeah. he is a, as a man. To ask him to do that for someone else um, is a tall task in his mind. We talked about the latter part of your years in the NFL in the locker room. You kind of were seen as the older guy. Yeah. You know, and the younger guys would come talk to you and seek you out for wisdom and things like that. In that context, what did they say to you about being a dad? You know, the re I don't want to marry anybody. Yeah. Well, you know, the opposite was sometimes true. Um, a, a lot of guys, I remember a conversation I had. I was playing for the Baltimore Ravens. So at this point I was in year like 13 or 14. And there was a young guy um, had just – you know, he found out his, his girlfriend was, was pregnant. And we were just talking, sitting in the training room. We both had an injury. I think I was rehabbing an Achilles uh, rupture, and he was rehabbing something else. And so we were just talking. And he said, you know, I, I want to be a great dad. I just don't know how. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, I, I know it's important. I, I, I want to be the dad for this child that I didn't have, mm -hmm. but I don't know how. And I think that that's a sentiment for a lot of young men that I came in contact with throughout my time in the NFL. Yeah, you had some guys who didn't think it was important. You had some guys who were married and had plenty of kids. I mean, I, I got some great fatherly advice from a teammate of mine named Teddy Bruschi uh, oh, during, yeah. Yeah, before I even had kids. Linebacker. Yeah, yeah linebacker in New England before I you even know, had none kids. None of those guys have good advice. I mean, <laughs> yeah, as a yeah. former quarterback, <laughs> let me tell you, who <laughs> likes those guys? Exactly. So there's this community within the locker room, but – I found that a lot of a lot of guys, especially those who perhaps didn't have the best father growing up, want to do the exact yeah. opposite. But they just don't know how and don't know yeah. if they can do it. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin, your wife, Kirsten, is a wonderful woman, a strong woman. Uh, what did Kirsten tell you that helped change your mindset in caring about her and caring <laughs> for her? You know, part of the difficulty with a, a, tr a transition out of sports is there there aren't hundred thousand people every single week shouting your name. There aren't, there aren't people coming to interview you. They're not people like tweeting at you anymore. And so you're out of this fandom and you're quote unquote regular. And I remember her telling me like, when you come home, like, I'm not one of your fans. Like, like, like I'm not a fan. I'm your spouse. I'm your friend. I'm your wife. I'm your confidant. I'm your lover. And, and and for me, I, I knew all those things, but yeah. I guess I was treating her, yeah. <laughs> you hey, know, hey, not, like yeah. I should, not like I should. <laughs> and it's just one of those reminders that you know that the relationship between husband and wife in the home um, is is a is mutual. Fandom is what can I get from you, hmm. and the relationship with your spouse is what what can I what can I do for you? That's yeah. I mean that's a, a really interesting insight. I mean when you're in the spotlight, yeah. and your wife is there trying to keep you on the ground. 
Yeah. Uh, many women feel insecure about their bodies, obviously. Mm-hmm. Men do, too, to be frank. That's part of it. Yeah. But uh, you had a story in the book about a time when you were thinking, and I think Kirsten may have been pregnant. I can't remember mm-hmm. exactly. But you kind of went out of your way to demonstrate, I'm thinking about you. Yeah. And you yeah. called some place to get some clothing <laughs> for her. What happened? I-, I found out very early um, in my marriage uh, about b- body image. And especially as as a woman's body goes through so much when they're pregnant, stuff that we don't oh, yeah. even, stuff that we can't understand. You know, we can appreciate it, but the words we say as as husbands, I always say that that loving your child or starting your family starts before the baby is even in your arms, uh. and that starts with how you treat mom, how you treat your wife, how you treat the mother of your child. What what are you saying? How are you affirming her? How are you loving her? How are you um, speaking life into her as she's going through all these physical changes? Part of the book is really telling men, these are the changes that are going to happen. Here's what you can do to be the best version of yourself to support her. And I remember sitting on, on the locker room floor in New England, buying maternity clothes from this British, this, this company in the UK that had these awesome maternity clothes clothes you know dresses and stuff that were form-fitting they were that, cute yeah it, 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 was, it wasn't like a 3x like like don't go, <laughs> don't go don't go buy your wife a 3x t-shirt and say it's maternity clothes like that's not going to get you where you're going but they, these were made specifically <laughs> for you always her. learn something yeah. at focus on the family these are made specifically for women who are going through pregnancy at different stages and they look great and we did a maternity shoot with her with these clothes and and, and something like that is just a gesture to show that you are you are researching and you you understand and you care about what she's going through. That was risky. Yeah, but she liked it. She oh she loved it. Okay, good. She loved it. I won. Woo, that could be risky. I was the man. Hey Benjamin, one thing that is really critical in that regard, you know, mm-hmm. depending upon what mom's doing and what mm-hmm. wife is doing, making sure she gets ample amounts of love and respect, obviously. So Kirsten, like Jean, worked at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she didn't homeschool. I think your wife is yeah, homeschooling, which is a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. But that idea, we need to honor them as as wives and as mothers mm-hmm. in the relationship because they're working hard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we think they're sitting at home doing nothing, but that isn't what they're doing. It, you know what? Another conversation that I've had <laughs> in my workplace at times was, mm-hmm. we're here doing this. They're over here doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. And I always look at the guy like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Seriously? Are, are you, they're keeping your kids alive. Like They're keeping you alive, actually. Like Many of you would have forgot to put on your underwear if your wife didn't tell you. And so, you know, but, but just that, that idea, I think, is dangerous. Yeah. And we as men, I think, have to be careful with how we joke about those sorts of things and how we challenge other men. But, you know, th- there's a wonderful book about love languages. And if you understand that, that every woman has kind of a, a different way she feels cared for and loved. As a man, as a father, it's your job to be a student of her. Mm. And, you know, for Kirsten, you know, the words of affirmation, you yeah. know, telling her that she's done a yeah. great job, affirming her in what she's doing. Man, you are taking care of the house. If she's working outside of the house, you're doing a great job there. You know, being specific about those different things shows with intentionality shows that we care. I think a lot of guys, many times we we, we just feel like, if we're the primary breadwinner, then then we have some outsized uh, worth in the house, and and she's lesser. Well, I can't and, imagine and, in your profession that was not extreme. I mean, you're yeah. an NFL football player, so yeah. these things become even more separated. I would think so. You got to work yeah. extra hard well, to make well, sure she's as valued as you are. You just have to be intentional with it. Yeah, I think. And, and what happens is, I'm sure you've experienced that when you when you pour into her the right way. It's like everything becomes so much easier. Yeah, she oh, yeah. She, she flourishes, and, and our wives have such uh, abilities. It, just because, as the man, you you go out of the house if she doesn't. You know, many women do. You go out of the house, and people tell you how good you are, mm-hmm. and affirm you, and give you performance reviews, and all those sorts of things. Don't automatically think that you're doing a better job at your job than she's doing that what God has given her to do. Well, what you said is so true, and it shows our lack of IQ actually. Because <laughs> for guys, I mean, we will we will do the opposite of what produces mm. that healthy relationship. Yeah, and I can't even tell you why. But you know, we don't go out of our way. How many hours did you spend trying to run a route or do a mm. blocking assignment? And yeah. Bill Belichick going, "That wasn't it, Watson." <laughs> 
Oh, you got to put your left got foot. PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, think of that. And then we don't apply that really. Generally, as men in yeah. our marriages, we don't think about it, which is the problem. Yeah. We it's, don't really it's about work that hard. Yeah. It's about prioritizing. And, and, and so often, you know, going back to that, that word of advice that I got from my teammate, Teddy Bruschi, he one time told me, because I'm a perfectionist. I what did he, he say to you? I don't think we said I, that. I know I'm going to go. Yeah. So I said, you know, I teased it. Now we're going to yeah, talk yeah, about it. Go. But I'm I'm a perfectionist. Um, you, you know, when I would have a great game, I would be you know a pl- pleasure to be around. Uh, when I had a bad practice or a bad game, nobody would, you know I don't want to be around anybody. I took a lot of it. This is even before we had kids. I took a lot of a lot of it out on my wife, on Kirsten. You know, I'd be argumentative at home. Um, you know, just really unpleasant. I uh, wasn't being the husband that I should be. And I remember Teddy told me. He said, when you go home, you need to leave work at work. It, it seems very simple. Right. But think about how hard it is for men to do this. Totally. When you go home, if you need to sit in the driveway or on the curb on the street for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, before you go in that house, you need to leave work at work. When you go in there, your husband, your father, you're, you're all the things that we say is important, but so often we bring all of the, the failure or the success mm-hmm of our occupation into our home life. And we end up creating um, a crucible of discouragement and fear and anger in a place that matters the most, Mm -hmm. where we have the most impact. And we sacrifice that because we're being paid over here and we're being honored over here in our work. And then at home, we're a shell of ourselves or we're so preoccupied with stuff going on out there that we that we're not the fathers and the, yeah. and the men that we're supposed to be. Oh, that's so applicable yeah. to everybody, every it is. man. It's, so. a da- it's, a yeah. daily, it's a daily exercise. Yeah. Uh, you have a story, and I think this is really good. The context is big family. I mean, you and John both. You've got, We've got six, six, and you've yeah. got seven, and I've got two. Yeah. But when you travel on an airplane, I mean, you've got <laughs> nine tickets. It's a thing. Dude, it's, it's, an, it's an investment. Yeah. <laughs> But you had a flight attendant that you, know, you, you getting all organized. I can't yeah. imagine what that organization no. looks like with seven kids. They're, the kids but are incredible. Yeah. Describe what happened. You mentioned it in the book, mm-hmm. but describe what happened and what he said to you. Yeah, I, I think it was a situation where I was flustered, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. I said, put that uh, in yeah, the Yeah, up. exactly. Sure. I was flustered. Um, I remember getting on an airplane. I forgot where we were going and just sitting there um, like, Lord, this is... I'm sweating. Like this is this is a lot. You know, these kids are driving me crazy. And this flight attendant, you know, comes down the aisle and just looks at our family, and you know, just says says, "Wow, it, these kids are beautiful. Um, you're so blessed." One of them said, I, "I wish that I I wanted to have a big family, but I haven't been able to." Wow. And just that was a witness. Yeah. 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 And so sometimes other people can see your blessing and you can't even see it. Yeah, that is so good. Like, like, like other people, other people will see the beauty of what God has done in your life, and in this case, the kids and the family, and encourage you in that time as a parent where you feel terrible that you're doing an awful job that is too much that you can't do it, and then God will use a flight attendant on a flight to say, "Man, look at what I look at what I've done." <laughs> Especially when your yeah. attitude is bad. Exactly, and, you're you're and immediately I'm like, Lord, thank you. <laughs> Lord, thank you that we're on the plane. Thank you that we're yeah. able to go where we're going. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> let me let me ask you. We got a few minutes left, but um, how is manhood laid out in the Bible, and why is the presence of a father in a family so critical? We touched on it in the opening way back when, mm-hmm. but I think you know our good friend Dr. Brad Wilcox, a researcher, mm-hmm. sociologist mm-hmm. out of the University of Virginia, and others are now coming to this conclusion. Aha. Dads play a big role in the well-being of a family when they're doing their role correctly or adequately. Yeah. Yeah. So in that context, like, what do you see in the Bible about being a, a husband and a father? Yeah, the Bible talks a lot about fatherhood, talks a lot about marriage, being a husband. Um, talks about how marriage is a reflection of Christ and his church, the importance of marriage. Uh, in our culture, it talks about um, you know children being an inheritance in Psalm 127 from the Lord, being like arrows in the hand of a warrior. We, we want to send them out into the world mm. fully equipped to do every good work, and, and that comes from the Father. We, we see in Scripture where, where fathers don't do their job. We think about um, people like, I was just reading about Eli, about the priest, <laughs> and how he's letting, letting his sons mm-hmm. do things that were, were um, yeah. an abomination. Mm. And, and what happens when a father is not active, we see the repercussions of that. 
Um, but we also see a, a God who says that he will, you know, be a father for the fatherless. And we see that ultimately when it comes to fatherhood, we as men are called to be um, the, the priest providers, protectors um, in our homes. Mm. We're to provide for our families. That's what the Bible calls us to do. You know, we're, we're to protect them physically, emotionally, spiritually. We're to be like a priest for them. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to, to go before the Lord on behalf of our families. What word do you have for us to hang in there, to engage and become better over time? Yeah. Des, your presence is more important than your perfection. Mm. Your presence is more important than your perfection. And presence is not just physical. You can be physically present and emotionally absent. Right. Um, your presence is, is about your... E emotional availability for your wife and for your kids. Your, your presence about, is about your spiritual readiness to engage. And also your presence is about physically being there right, with your family, with your wife at home. Um, we're, we're all going to fail. And, and I think that, that the, larger, the larger issue for me as a perfectionist, in the home is one thing, but the larger issue with a perfectionist is not understanding grace. Yeah. And a lot of times as a perfectionist, I'll give grace to other people, won't give it to myself. For some reason, I think I'm above grace. Wow. And what God is saying, no, my grace is enough for you. My blood is enough for you as a father, as a worker, as a husband, as a leader, as a businessman, whatever it is, as a sinner, my grace is enough for your perfection. Don't think that you're above it. Um, the last thing is about perseverance. The Bible talks a lot about perseverance and it's not too late as a dad. If you haven't done this thing well and you've been poor at it, you've been absent physically, emotionally, spiritually, maybe you've been violent, whatever it is, you've done things that you know you shouldn't. It's time to turn your hearts back to ask for forgiveness. I've had to do that before. Say mm. something to the kid. Mm, shouldn't have said that. And then persevere to move forward because you understand that there's a certain goal and that in order to get there, you've got to persevere through. Wow, that is good yeah. stuff, Benjamin. You'd be uh, a key in any locker room. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Your great book, The New Dad's Playbook, Gearing Up for the Biggest Game of Your Life. And it's so true at the end of it. You've already done it. You've retired at 39. Now when you get down the next many years, it's your family that's most important. Yeah. I mean, it might have been great to catch a pass from yeah. Brady, but man, it's going to be a much better thing to catch a pass from one of your kids. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and, and you know what? And, and you know, whatever job you're in, you know, sometimes people say, you know, uh, what's the family life balance? Family, you know, family work, yeah. work balance. You know, I always answer that question by saying, <clears throat> look, we all have different occupations. We all need to make decisions with our family in mind. But whatever time you have at home, you need to be fully invested. Another good piece of advice. Totally. You, you could be a guy who works from home and, and a guy who doesn't work at all but not be fully invested. Or a guy who works on 9 to 5 and is home for five hours with his kids. But those five hours, he's pouring into them. He's open with them. You know, He engages with them, honors his wife, loves her how she needs to be loved. That guy's being impactful with what God has given him to do. Well said. That's for sure. Benjamin, this has been great. Again, your your book, The New Dad's Playbook. I think you get the heart of it and uh, so much wisdom in here. I hope uh, we've touched the surface, obviously. We can't get into all of it, but you can by getting a copy directly from Focus on the Family. And when you do, all the proceeds go right back into helping families. If you make a gift of any amount, we'll send it to you as our way of saying thank you for being part of the ministry. The details are in the program description or give us a call, 800, the letter A in the word family. And thanks for joining us for Focus on the Family with Jim Daly. I'm John Fuller inviting you back on Monday as we once more help you and your family thrive in Christ.